Okay, so um, our next speaker is uh, Mike Shebenow. Uh, he is currently with uh, Samsung, where he leads, um, I believe, their GPU research for mobile GPUs. And uh, it's kind of a progression for him, going from working with Yale a long, longish time ago <laughs> on making sure that we could all enjoy high performance computing and high performance on our CPUs with establishing a way of doing out of order execution that we can all actually make use of. And then kind of making sure it gets into industry in a couple of, uh, of industry positions with uh, IBM or Torola and HAL, and then moving to GPUs, where he helped make GPUs high performance and effective for all of us to use. And now he's gonna make sure we actually all have one by putting them into uh, Samsung devices. So, Mike, I need to waste another minute, or you're good? <laughs> I, I need to waste, yeah. I mean, the only problem I have is it's on the wrong screen. See if I can fix that. Uh, first off, I want to, you know, as I said, I'm a Yale student from a long time ago, and I want to talk, uh, give a little bit of a story. I think related to to that, which is, you know, when I was a grad student, one thing I I do remember vividly was um, I was walking. I think there was a couple of us. I don't remember when, maybe it was you and I, or so we were leaving the office around one in the morning, and Yale saw us leave, and he said, "Oh, you're going on lunch break." <laughs> so, you know, I, I did a lot of this while I was presenting, you know, I was making this presentation over, you know, in the plane over the Pacific, I go to Samsung a lot, Korea, and uh, so you could say I made these, some of these slides were made over my lunch break, so. Uh, uh, when we started this, uh, you know, I saw that the topic was visions for the future, and, you know, I was kind of scared, because, you know, I, I have trouble visualizing, you know, two weeks from now. But uh, so I'll try and, you know, it's a pretty broad topic. What do you mean the future, future when? Like, you know, next week or next year or 20 years or 40 years. And so I was trying to, th I was thinking about that. And I, I, I went, you know, the past is a really good indicator of what's gonna happen, you know, what, what happened before. Um, you, know, you can uh, kind of indicate how much change we're gonna see in the future and it's pretty astonishing. So uh, before I go into that, I have to, you know, my Samsung wants me to give a disclaimer on all the talks I give that Everything here is my own opinion, has nothing to do with Samsung, there's nothing, you know, don't take anything here, Samsung's doing this. Uh, so, the first thing I thought it shows, you know, how astonishing, you know, how far we come. You know, I was thinking about it, you know, when I was a student at Yale, I was really excited to get a VT100 terminal with a 1200 baud modem. And, you know, that was, you know, only 30 something years ago. And you know, today right now I'm hooked up with a laptop and here a hotspot and this is uh, you know capable of going up to 300 megabaud, right, with uh, LTE. So if you think about the speed improvements that have occurred uh, in that period of time, it's pretty astonishing. You know, again, it, I, I say you know what will it look like 2050, which is like you know less than 40 years now, about 40 years. If you go back 40 years to the mid 70s, you know, you know that was when the Cray was coming out, and that that was a 200 megaflop machine, and, and what we're shipping on cell phones now is about a teraflop. Um, so it's five orders of magnitude faster, and as was pointed out, you know, less than three watts, right? So, and it, certainly the Cray back then was a lot more than three watts. Um, so again, you can see the timeline, you know, what's, it's been really, really rapid, and so to get to the point where we're today, which is, you know, a cell phone, what is it gonna look like 40 years from now? If you go backwards 40 years and you say, what do we have? You know, I, I'm pretty sure none of us 40 years ago would have imagined, I know I didn't, you know, I think 40 years ago, uh, that was when I was in high school, and you know, the, I remember it with excitement when the MITS Altair 8800 came out, you know, popular science, and that was a really exciting thing to have a, a fast 8080 at two megahertz, right? So, really huge changes. In computer architecture theme, this is, um, you know, my myopic view of it, you know, what I thought was hot topics back, way back when in different decades. Um, you know, what, what's been important, you know, I think the 60s, uh, that was just sort of the, maybe the, the golden naissance of computer architecture. And, you know, 70s vector machines and, you know, CISC and, and having instruction sets close to the metal, or close to the programming languages, rather, was in fashion. Uh, Unix was, start, you know, coming into vogue. Uh, I remember again when I started at Berkeley uh, back in the 70s, I had been using really crappy operating systems and I had died and gone to heaven when I used you know, Unix version 7. So 
uh, th th that was kind of that era. The you know, 80s risk superscalar. When we did the HPS stuff, cache coherency was hot. Uh, I think the 90s it came into you know faster and faster. That was deck alpha, and then going up to you know hitting a gigahertz in AMD. And then the, you know the 2004. I guess mean, you know everything. Certainly now, GPUs are a really hot topic. Uh, looking at papers being submitted, it looks to me like the vast majority of them that I saw at least were on GPUs or how to use them. But what's next? I actually I don't know. I thought I would focus instead on on problems that we're going to have in the future as opposed to solutions or how we're going to build things, more talking about what, what's needed. So near, there's near term and long term. So near term clients and clouds, I think, is the, we're, we're going toward. In the long term, you know, there's the traditional thing that we're doing now plus maybe some new things. So in clients, uh, one of the things we, I see at least is diversity. Uh, you know, we, we added some pretty traditional things, like when I have up here on the podium, you know, cell phones, laptops, tablets. There's a lot of new things coming out that are, you know, not so common. Uh, wearables are a, a, a big hot topic, you know, things, that, you know, biometric sensors. I talk with a couple of professors and they're doing research now where, in a lot of things where you can wear something in your hand and it'll actually do um, non-invasive scanning of your body, like for example. You can shine a beam of light into your arm, and by looking at what the signature coming back from that, you know, like cancer, for example, has different metabolic heat signature than than regular cells. So the one professor I was talking to, you know, he was like looking for that signature, and able to detect cancer in your bloodstream early. So there'd be lots of health implications for wearables, lots of applications that I think people haven't thought about, um, or you know, things that'll sense on our body. And there's also IoT, which is the Internet of Things. Uh, that's also very, you know, I think people are more familiar with that with home integration, things like, you know, uh, thermostats, you know, the Nest thing, for example, is IoT. But there's some really unique things I've heard about, like, uh, you know, smart garbage cans. And you, you joke, but uh, they, you know, having garbage cans, for example, a lot, some cities are saving money now. So instead of having, you know, garbage trucks go from every, you know, go to every single garbage can, whether it's full or not, the garbage can will actually tell you that it's full, and you can now the cities can save money by only going to the ones that actually need to get emptied. So there's like really weird things that you normally wouldn't think about, but uh, you know they're, they're they're good applications. I think cloud integration is another big part of that, which is you know how can we bring more of the internet, the knowledge, you know, people to to your fingertips, and that's a big you know big thing that's going to be important. So drivers for the architecture. Uh, I certainly get beat up a lot uh, on this term. I guess I don't know if it's a common term, but at least in the Samsung, it's a common term: PPA, which is performance power area. Uh, we we kind of maniacally look at that, either from ourselves or from our our vendors that are supplying us. What's your PPA? Um, and you know, we we kind of it's really about efficiency. There's power efficiency and area efficiency, and we we look at that. And I think everything going forward is going to be based upon. PPA analysis. Uh, all engineers will have to drive PPA. There's just a limited amount of power. I think, as Arvin mentioned, you know, from an er ergonometric perspective, you can't. You know, this people complain when the case temperature rises about two or three degrees C over ambient, right? So, it's a thermodynamic limit. It's not battery life. It's just thermodynamic. You you, you have limit. You know, the bigger the device, you can burn more power, but you know, finite amount of area. You know, the more power it is, the hotter it gets. So I think that that PPA is probably the number one on the list. Specialization is another one I think you mentioned as well. Uh, you know, phones, phones, phones interact, cameras, camera, refrigerators, refrigerators. I, I think that the there'll be less room for generalization and more room for specialization. For, you know, designing hardware that's customized for uh, the application at hand. Rapid time to market is also. Uh, extremely important. Um, you don't have time to, to you, you know, years is not available anymore. It's, like it's now, you know, year or months. So, and Samsung certainly, when I worked there, everything's driven at a really rapid pace. Cloud. I think it's similar. Uh, PPA is again the big driver, uh, aka per, per watt per dollar. Uh, Virtualization, security. I mean, I just saw this morning in USA Today. You know, they were talking about, uh, you know, 56 million. I think I forgot which company it was, but you know, 56 million credit cards numbers were hacked. 
You know, this is a real problem for, the, for us as computer developers. You know, we, we can't allow that type of security lapses. And then just, of course, storage architecture and connectivity. So long term, uh, I, it's dangerous. I think I remember when I, uh, before I met Yale, or actually b at between when I met Yale and when I went back to work for Yale at Berkeley, I was, uh, I was working for uh, AMD. I remember at the time, uh, people saying, oh, I don't know if we'll ever get below one micron. And, you know, I've also heard, will we ever get to one gigahertz in CPUs? So this is kind of really dangerous to make these predictions, and I'm kind of reticent here, but anyways, I'll, you know, for what it's worth. I think there's like three areas that we'll probably go to. There's traditional computing that we're doing today, cloud and client, uh, our AIs, and then intelligent applications, kind of the inverse of that. So traditional computing, I think cloud, cl the biggest problem I think we have with this is cloud client, it's a programming problem. Uh, how do we, you know, I, I, having done play with app development on the side, it's a real pain to program these things. Um, you know, where there was integrating cloud information with uh, the client information is a real problem, it's painful. Uh, the operating systems don't help really. Uh, there's a lot of libraries, you know, you're basically using, you know, HTTP or something like that. Um, SSL to, to talk to things. It's really, it's not a very convenient um, programming environment. So maybe, you know, my little pet idea is a uh, single system image, um, solder computing, and try and integrate uh, better integration and operating system level between device and cloud. Uh, speed and capacity will obviously get focused on, you know, just ever increasing either more flops, uh, more megabytes, um, more megabits per second, I think that'll be obviously a thing. Environmental integration, uh, a lot of people I talk to, they're talk, for example, telepresence, uh, you know, talk to some guys at uh, Henry Fuchs at UNC, and he's working on that for sure. So telepresence is like teleconferencing with video, and so it's immersion. So you can imagine I have the either VR or AR glasses, and I wanna have a conference with somebody who's like say in Korea, and with VR, AR, there's a camera focused on them. I can see them via that camera, and they can see me via another camera in my room. And we have the, the hardware software systems inject the people into your field of vision as if they're there. Um, that's telepresence. That it requires tremendous compute capability. We have to basically uh, do a 3D reconstruction for what we see in one camera, project it across the net, and then do a 3D reconstruction back at the in your eyes in the, in the, in the display for your eyes. So lots and lots of compute, but also environmental integration, like I showed here with the cameras. You know, we need cameras everywhere. Um, obviously, it has privacy issues and security issues that we have to get addressed. But you know, assuming we can solve those uh, privacy security problems, which are not really technical, um, that you know that will make things like that uh, possible. Oops. Okay. So AI, uh, obviously. This is creating artificial entities, and there's some obvious applications, robotics, self-driving cars, and all that, but it's also been like machine learning. If you look at what, there's a lot of companies that are now working on machine learning, and it's really user interfaces, like uh, user anticipation is what I would call it. So uh, anticipating what the user will want to do so there are fewer strokes on the, on the phone. That's a, another ripe area for uh, computer architecture, potentially computer applications, software applications for sure, but you know, again, trying to anticipate what people will want or will want to do. I mean, all of you have been driving, for example, you know, either you know, Siri or Samsung with, you know, OK Google. And, you know, you, you know that it's not exactly the best interface right now. It could certainly be improved. And finally, there's uh, intelligent amplification, which is an old term. Uh, what it means is really, I think, instead of creating artificial entities like AI is trying to do, it's trying to amplify who we are. So, you, know, you don't create new entity. You're still the entity. It's more amplifying. So, it's, you know, it's machine-assisted. You know, how can computers directly, how can we better interact with computers? Uh, I think, you know, relative to a human, you know, outputs, brain, thought, sensing, um, input, you know, could be visual, audio, or haptic. And I think, you know, one of the, for example, can we do things non-invasively? Um, I certainly don't think we want the matrix, you know, hookup thing, but, um, you know, here's like an example of something. This is done from Berkeley, and where they used a functional MRI, and they can scan the brain so that the image on the left is what was presented to the human, 
and then the sensor on the right is what they can reconstruct from looking at, at uh, with the MRI. And it's kind of a little freaky. So, you know, at some point, clearly, you know, we don't want to have, you know, it's not convenient to have an MRI machine lugged around with you. But um, that's, you know, this is today, and, you know, in the future, it may be very different, right? 40, you know, who can say, again, I take you back to what was around 40 years ago and how it looks, you know, then and compare what we have now. So 40 years is a long time, and maybe this is something going to happen. So impact to computer architecture, I, I think this is the area I'm, I'm less, least comfortable with. I think, you know, technology certainly is a huge driver, and I'm not a technologist either. Uh, you know, what, how will technology affect computer architecture? You know, kind of quantum devices, new logic uh, technologies, I, I really don't know what will be there in the future. Uh, you know, if I were to say things that I think I'd like to work on, uh, you know, I'd certainly like a much deeper understanding of how, how do you architect neural nets. Everything I've read on neural nets seems more like alchemy than a little bit like alchemy as opposed to um, understanding. Uh, you know, why do you connect certain networks? You know, nets and what's the architecture? How does feedback work? Uh, it, I don't have a good understanding of it. I think highly parallel SSI-enabled hardware and software, you know, cellular operating systems. Um, I would definitely, I think, is a, a, a really interesting area to work on. Uh, I think hardware, some hardware supports required for that. I've always viewed hardware as kind of accelerated software, and you know, I think I would start from the software stack and basically trying to find out where we can accelerate, make it you know, where we have bottlenecks, uh, how are we going to get better? And, you know, clearly better human machine I.O. Is, is needed still. So, anyways, and thank you.